Hello, if you are joining us, you probably know that I am Rita McGrath uh, and I am um, hosting a Fireside Chat with Jeff Saviano, who is the Global Tax Innovation Lead for EY. Uh, a firm that is committed to um, making a better working world, which I think is quite inspiring. And uh, so what we're going to talk about is uh, Jeff's work at EY, uh, you know, kind of some of the big projects he's working on and uh, some of the ideas he has for how you can use the tax system to change the world for the better, which I think is pretty inspiring. So welcome, welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. So excited to be here. Uh, re really looking forward to spending some time with you. Rita, such a such a big fan of your work, and uh, it really is um, uh, thrilling for me to spend some time and talk about uh, some cool issues today. Yeah, so um, let's just start with just so our our listeners get to know who you are. Um, how did you get to where you are? What were the, what were the stops along the way in your journey? Sure. Uh, well, I've been um, I've been at EY uh, for quite a long time. Actually, I started there twenty nine years ago last week. So I uh, came uh, to EY out of law school. I'm a tax lawyer by training uh, and have been serving clients in the tax arena uh, at EY uh, for many, many years. And uh, as part of that, along the way, uh, caught the innovation bug. And I go back close to 10 years ago, uh, we had something small in the U.S. happen called the uh, Affordable Care Act. You remember when we had that little yes. bill that passed and uh, the firm asked me to take a look and to help build teams and, and see how do we help our clients deal with the complexities of a new law like the Affordable Care Act and something clicked for me and just the excitement of, of uh, everything we do at, at EY is about our clients and, and, and helping to serve and and how could we help deal with the myriad of issues? I still remember, and I'm based, uh, I'm based in Boston. I remember taking a week out of my life, going to uh, those in the audience, if they know Boston, the Boston Public Library is a, a beautiful old library. Think of long mahogany tables with those green lights. And, and I went there for a week and I read the entire Affordable Care Act. And then, um, which I think I'm probably the fourth person in the world to perhaps read the whole thing, but uh, <laughs> something happened for me and really caught the innovation bug and, mm -hmm. and have been um, building teams and building solutions uh, ever since. That's great. So what were some of the biggest prob problematic issues in, in the ACA, uh, you know, just from a, from a tax point of view? Well, uh, for many, they view the Affordable Care Act as a health care bill. We, we, as a tax lawyer, we viewed it as a tax bill. Uh, when you look at the, the penalties that were imposed and the implications on companies, that the tax overlay to the ACA was, was quite significant. And there was a burden on employers. Employers had to provide affordable health coverage to their employees. And if they didn't, then, then there was a penalty. And so the, the, the tax implications were significant. And as companies were dealing with that, we found they needed advice and technology to help guide them through that process. So, so that, was, uh, that was one. And now I lead uh, a team at EY. I lead innovation for our global tax practice. Uh, we are uh, about 60,000 tax professionals uh, strong. And we have a lab that we founded that uh, I lead in Cambridge. Uh, we are practically on the campus of MIT. We do quite a bit with MIT and we build, build solutions leveraging advanced technologies to solve big tax problems in the world. You know, it's interesting when, um, when we first started exploring doing this together and I was looking at sort of tax innovation and it's not what people typically think of right i mean the two don't sort of naturally emerge like tech innovation of course you know uh, uh, new markets of course but not so much taxes and yet when you think about it taxes influence everything you know where you live what you choose to buy what your employment relationships are like you know i mean it's so much that it really touches um and so it kind of makes sense that that would be a place where innovation would be critically important uh I'm a little biased, Rita, but admittedly, when we when when we formed this team and we formed the lab to focus on solving big tax, and I should include trade, tax, and trade. Uh, when we formed it, we admittedly were looking at the commercial sector and our commercial clients, 
Interestingly, I think governments have been as interested in our work and, and we've had delegations from uh, countries like Australia and Scotland and Kenya come to us, come to our lab because they're faced with profound issues. This issues with domestic resource mobilization and, and raising capital um, in especially low middle income countries problems they have meeting the demands of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how can they move their economies forward. Taxes are the lifeblood of economies. And, and the interplay with technologies, especially now advanced technologies and how they can help governments is something I'm passionate about. This intersection of democracy and technology and policy and taxation, as we emerge from the pandemic, we think that's going to be critically important. And mm -hmm. so that's what gets me gets me going every day is helping governments and our commercial clients deal with these issues. So talk about a typical visit to the lab. What what is involved? Well, uh, one aspect about our lab is that we have probably more lawyers in our lab than, than most other labs in the world. So uh, it's less um, uh, Bunsen burners and beakers and lab coats and smoking um, concoctions. Um, but you know, we're as much focused on po uh, technology policy issues and developing advanced technology systems to help solve some of those issues. To bring, to double click on that, to bring that to life a bit, we've built uh, artificial intelligence based solutions to extract information from documents. And we heard this from leaders in Kenya. They came to our lab along with the World Bank and um, uh, they talked about you know, how much they still rely on how much paper there still is in the world and then the opportunities and the need to digitize processes in both governments and commercial sectors. Incredible. So we built a solution to extract information from documents and to digitize it using that data to drive better decision processing data. And so that's um, that was one early solution from our lab. We call that document intelligence. And we, we, we built solutions um, when organizations have a need to extract information from the same kind of document repeatedly, we find that the machines are better at that than the humans are. And so we're building advanced systems along those lines. So you'd have a delegation come and you'd sort of jointly explore the problem. Is that how it would work? We've had some, um, I mentioned the, the work that we do with MIT. It's great. We are literally across the street. Uh, we have a research collaboration with the Connection Science Lab, and I joined that team uh, as a fellow a few years ago. Uh, Professor Alex Sandy Pentland is a rock star data scientist in the world. We do quite a bit with Sandy, and so we'll bring clients. We'll come into our lab. Sometimes you know, we'll go across the street. We'll have workshops uh, on campus and better understand their issues and how advanced technologies like AI, blockchain, and advanced data methods, how they can serve as next generation solutions to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. So they would come and articulate a problem and that would kick off a work stream? Is that, is that how it would work? Uh, that is, yeah, that's a big part of it. Or we'll, we'll hear the same issue. We, um, we've got a session next week that we're planning uh, to, to see how can we build the next generation of uh, solutions for governments. And, and rather than doing it for one, we've been aggregating needs across many governments and trying to find that thread. And, and it's such an interesting time, Rita, to be having this conversation because of, of the fractures and the fissions that have resulted during the pandemic uh, have really exposed that, especially within governments, the technology systems need an upgrade. And we've, been, we've done some research to see how much, how much digital transformation do we think will, will now be happening emanating from the pandemic and companies, uh, I'm sorry, countries have pledged uh, you know, close to $2 trillion in, in digital transformation. And, and we're already seeing that happen. We're seeing projects get launched and, and significant issues that emerged in the pandemic Governments are building teams now to go after that. And, and there's been a, an acceleration of that, we think, from the pandemic. My own belief is that the next 24 months will be so critical to resetting this 
government digital infrastructure that will drive so much of economies. Mm-hmm. And you've talked about making some of these digital assets, you know, more affordable or even free. So that kind of like the building blocks and so those yes. governments could, yeah. could build on those. That's interesting. So how does that get funded? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. We call that digital public goods. And so we uh-huh. joined, um, uh, we also do quite a bit of work and, and we uh, started an organization a few years ago called the Prosperity Collaborative. And uh, the Prosperity Collaborative is, um, is a collaboration with EY, uh, MIT, uh, the World Bank, we do quite a bit with, uh, and New America, which is a civil society organization, wonderful civil society organization, uh, um, doing great things with digital technologies for public good, and uh, the Michael Dukakis Center for Leadership. Um, the answer to the question, what has Governor Dukakis um, uh, been up to lately? And he has become an AI zealot in the world and his leadership promoting artificial intelligence systems for governments is so inspiring to us. So these five organizations formed the Prosperity Collaborative and our mission is to help governments advance uh, what we call digital public goods to solve big problems across tax and trade. You may, uh, some in our audience may not be familiar with the term, what is a digital public good? Digital public good is in think open source software open systems, open standards that governments and public-private partnerships together can leverage uh, building assets for networks. And we think that's a big idea that's emerging very quickly, uh, Rita, from the pandemic is that there are networks that are demanding technology to serve those networks rather than the old world of building technology for one company or for one government. Now it's how do these networks work together with an ecosystems, building technology for an ecosystem rather than for the individual players. We think that's a big idea and we think that will be pervasive across the globe over the next few years. Yeah, one of the things that's been talked about a lot is how value is actually going from things like products and services to interactions, you know, to the data around the products and services. And um, um, Eric Joachim Staller, who was on one of our previous chats, talks about something he calls the interaction field. And I kind of see a lot of what you're doing here. The analogy would be, you know, the first laying of, you know, cross-continental cable or, or you know, <laughs> building that, those building blocks upon which these interaction fields can now start to flourish. Mm, I love that. Yeah, what a what a great way to look at it. And and it also though, Rita, it highlights one of the critical gaps in the world that you look across. So if you buy into the fact that networks need technology assets to guide the activity across the multiple stakeholders, we don't have adequate governance mechanisms in the world to help those organizations come together. There are new technologies that will demand it. Blockchain as a distributed ledger technology is all about multiple stakeholders leveraging the system, but we don't have organizations, public or private, or governance mechanisms that can guide how can those organizations align to build something unique for them. And we see this all around the world. I think it's an area that we need breakthroughs. We need the best of public and private together to solve that governance gap. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, one of the theories that I'm very taken with um, lately, and it's just, you know, it's sort of one of those things, once you think about it, you don't think about things the same way again, which is Carlotta Perez's work on uh, bubbles and golden ages. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but mm-hmm. in a nutshell, what she says is every time that it's happened five times before, and that every time we have a fundamental shift in productivity enhancing technology, that we go through these predictable stages. And so there's what she calls installation which is the bubble stage. And in the bubble stage, capital flows into these startup markets and innovations and new technologies. And, and, you know, you could see it with the canals, you could see it with the railroads going back even further in history, you saw it with the industrial revolution. And so what happens is capital flows to these things. They create this infrastructure almost of the basis for which the new technology will, will come. But in the early stages, it's pretty ugly. You have you know, massive inequality. You've got um, the kind of things we're seeing today, right? Where it's so much money concentrated in so few hands. 
But her point is this, that, that what that does is it forces capitalists who would never make these investments on a sane discounted cash flow level, it forces all that capital to build the infrastructure. And then at what she calls the, the turning point, uh, which is where I think she thinks we are around now, you have this shift from investment capital to production capital. And what that looks like is all of a sudden with the speculation calms down, business begins to assume more of a more of a sensible shape. Um, you don't have the, the bubble thing happening anymore. And if it's if it's orchestrated properly, and this is something that, that I think your comments really highlight, if it's orchestrated properly, it can lay the foundation for a new golden age. But if you don't mm. manage that transition well, you, you have far more chaotic conditions. Mm. And so her point would be government needs to take action and we could be poised for a new golden age that's both greener and mm. and more more equal. You know, the, the mm. resources are more are more widely shared. And mm. so the reason I think that's mm. so interesting is because I think many of us have as a reference point some point in history which we think of as normal, you know. So post-World right. War II, boom, in the United States, or maybe going all the way back to the turn of the century in the progressive era, or you know, whatever. Mm. And what her work suggests is no, that that we have these very predictable cycles in capitalism and that it's a feature of capitalism, not a bug, which I thought was interesting. But the thing that it really, really caught my attention. Well, what really, really caught my attention was this notion that no sensible person on their own would build this infrastructure, that it actually takes a bubble to suck in all the capital that's needed mm. to build this infrastructure. And then you need to manage how do you suck it out again? <laughs> right, right. It is. It's fascinating. What an inspiring way to look at it. And if you think about what are the rails that we need in place today? So if you believe that we are in a bubble or if it's because of the capital that's flowing in, we can easily look to countries that have already articulated they will be in the aggregate, there'll be trillions of dollars that will be flowing in. And that's just from government perspective and others that that what's been missing, I think, is that that we we haven't really seen the regulatory uh, side catch up. And you know, it's it very quickly we'll start getting to issues around data privacy. It's hard. It's hard to think of advanced technology application without having a deep, deep point of view on what does that mean for you and I, reader and, and citizens, and our data and the trade-off, the trade-off between privacy issues and the utility from data. And that's something that we spend a lot of time with our friends at MIT on that trade-off. Do you have to trade off the utility of data. As data utility rises, you have to naturally have a reduction in privacy. We don't think that that necessarily has to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it, it's really indicative of the point that you're making that you need the, the regulatory rails from government in place. So it's exciting to see as this capital is coming in, the really smart organizations are investing in understanding and frankly, helping to shape that regulatory layer that has to occur as the money is, is flowing into these industries. Yeah, and I think you, you're spot on that, you know, regulations lack, uh, lag, sorry, lag um, yeah, like, realities yeah. on the ground often by 10 or 15 years. So I actually wrote about this um, with respect to Facebook that, you know, my concern with them um, is like if the ordinary person on the street knew how much of their data was being sucked in and distributed to third party players and used in ways that, you know, are buried deep within the terms and provisions that you sign up for when you want to post the picture of your grandkid, right? If people, if ordinary people actually knew that, you know, you would never have the regime that we have now. And part of the problem now is it's gotten so embedded and entrenched in these business models that I think it's going to be hard to navigate our way out of it. But I do think we're looking at kind of a standard oil moment, right? Which is, which is again, back to Carlotta's theory. Um, you have these monopolists that, again, aggregate mm. the, the money, aggregate the uh, technology, uh, become incredibly powerful. And as we navigate our way to this next golden age, the breaking them up is pretty typical. It is, it is pretty typical. And maybe to bring it back to taxes, because isn't that what you do on all of your Friday um, uh, fireside chats? <laughs> of course. About Taxes are, taxes are our number one issue. <laughs> uh, I realize that you know, I get crazy about it, but perhaps not everybody is. But, I, but, but tax policies are so important in this ecosystem as you describe it. I love, I still think the best articulation was from President Reagan, where he said, you know, from a tax policy perspective, uh, if it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize it. <laughs> and I think so much of tax policy, you can whittle down to one of those three. If it's moving, tax it to raise revenue. 
if it keeps moving the wheels of the economy, then you'll see the flow of, of regulations. Um, and then if you, uh, if, if something stops and we saw that in the pandemic, if, so, if it's stopping, then the subsidies that come and how important that is. And, and so I think President Reagan said it very well. Uh huh. So picking up on the pandemic for a minute, uh, you and I were talking the other day about um, how much of that money that was sort of unleashed into the economy has really gone into the wrong hands. It's, it's something that um, that we're quite concerned about. You just made to come up one layer from a tax perspective every year. We believe that there's close to three trillion dollars is lost for tax fraud. Uh, for those in the audience that are interested in the sustainable development goals and the money that we need across the globe to solve these big problems in the world around education and climate change and and um, the underpinning of the SDGs, uh, if you solve, uh, which you'll never completely solve, but take a big bite out of tax fraud, and you know that money could be used to to fund the SDGs. Um, from a stimulus perspective, and there was tremendous and all the great work from many, many governments to get money in people's hands uh, was so admirable. But what it highlighted, though, is that those digital pipes in many places were not in place. They weren't in place safely and securely. There was lost, lots of money lost to the scoff laws and, and to fraudsters. And you know, there is clearly improvement that's necessary in the world to improve um, in areas like digital identity, having digital identification systems in the world, having technology platforms that are safe and secure so governments know if they need to issue stimulus to the citizens that they can get it to the people that really need it. It's not working well in the world and it's something we all, that's, that's not a government problem, that's not a commercial private sector problem. Collectively, we need to figure out a better approach. Mm. And do you think, you, you, what kinds of organizations would take the lead on that? Because that's like the classic public policy problem, right? Which is, it affects everybody sort of in a big way, but nobody in yeah. a specific way. Yeah. Well, and I think to, to go back to the issue we were talking about around governance, I really believe that it is no single institution is, is quite equipped. I look, you know, part of the reason we formed our prosperity collaborative is that we have an appreciation. Um, I love and have so much um, deep respect for organizations like the World Bank and MIT and New America and our partners in the collaborative. We recognize that none of our institutions singularly are positioned to solve these problems alone. It takes this amalgamation. So I think that's one way that we're trying to, to do it. Um, I think you've got a distinct role across civil society organizations, perhaps as a watchdog of both the public and private sector. Um, the UN is doing quite a bit in this space to advance digital public goods. But I, and I'm, I'm really uh, excited about the moves from the Biden administration to recognize the opportunities to build a digital infrastructure. We're looking forward, there'll be a summit for democracy uh, that they're organizing later in 2021 or early 2022, where uh, there'll be a component of um, looking at these digital technologies and how they can improve um, society, not just in the US, but seeing the US as a leader again in the world in this space. So I think, I think countries like the US have an important role to play here too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's um, go back to privacy, because I think that's one of the most interesting moments of our day, because a lot of our conventional rules around privacy depended on things being analog. You know, so an example that terrifies me is there was a, a, a woman who, um, you know, by all accounts, led a normal middle class life, but had had, you know, some run-ins with the law and had engaged in some, you know, un untoward behavior when she was quite young, when she was in her teens, um, but had put all that behind her, had served her time, went to college, retrained, joined her community and so forth. And, uh, and yet one of her kids came back from school and, you know, all teary eyed and said that her friend had found her mom's, um, you know, uh, arrest records from, you know, two decades, mm -hmm. three decades ago by that time. And what had happened was that this scummy internet 
person had actually gone to local county courthouses where these records are publicly available, but they're in these yeah. you know, massive paper ledgers and, you know, you'd really have to make a big effort to go uh, find them. But what this guy did was he went and he imaged all of these publicly available records, right? Put them mm -hmm. up on a website and asked people to pay 500 bucks to have them taken down. I mean, could you think mm -hmm. of anything more just yeah. horrible? Yeah, how terrible. <laughs> How terrible. I think mean, what you're um, what you're referencing is to believe in our right to be forgotten or mm -hmm. what rights do we have over our over our data. And there is a distinct need for these discussions to to happen. And I think we can look not just within the U.S., but you know, this is happening all across the globe that communities and societies are are having this discussion of of what what privacy principles do they want to regulate? I think it is, um, um, it is something that, that uh, I certainly believe that it's a, it's a national debate and it's a national discussion that has to happen. And we haven't seen this yet around the world. We have not seen this regulatory data privacy layer, but it's my own belief that that is something that will happen um, as a result of the pandemic will accelerate that. I can give you one example. In the early days of the pandemic, uh, we worked with uh, a startup that came out of MIT called PathCheck. And it developed one of the early generation of contact tracing technology. Think of the early days of back in the spring and the summer, uh, back in 2020, when um, all of a sudden there were startups and others that were developing contact tracing technology. And you know, I was really um, taken by the fact that as part of that, they, they convened leading data privacy experts around the world that recognized that all of a sudden there was a new data uh, concern with our proximity data, proximity mm -hmm. data of where you and I were. If a technology could say, Rita, where it could, could show on uh, just imagine your screen, your computer could show where you were precisely over the last week. Do you want that made public? And very was, minority report, right? Very minority report. Very much so. And I really give this team uh, led by Professor Ramesh Raskar so much credit to ensure that they had a point of view on the policy debate and the policy discussions that had to that had to happen alongside the technology development. And I, I use it as an example of it's not enough to just develop the leading technology, but you've got to have that policy team aligned to it, addressing these issues as they arise. And that's one example that really struck me in a crisis moment. We were in a crisis moment of how to use technology to help slow the spread of the virus. This team recognized that you can't just just run over these privacy concerns. You need to really hit it head on and hit it fairly. And what, where did they come down? Uh, they came down. I think that it's that it's a discussion that really needs to happen on a national level. Um, uh, there were quite a few countries who were interested in adopting the, these technologies, and you can look around the world and. And you'll find governments and nations that are in very different places. Um, um, in some areas, per, uh, for example, in Eastern Europe, the government has taken the data and they believe that there was an overriding public purpose to take data like proximity and other data and use it for the public good. That's That was not as prevalent in more democratic nations. And I mm -hmm. think that's that it's it's an issue being treated differently around the world. Mm -hmm. Which is concerning. Um, you know, we've heard proximity data, uh, facial recognition data used by governments starts to get, you know, pretty creepy. Um, mm. You understand that not everybody has the best motives at heart um, for what that data is going to be used for. Um, very, very scary. It is. It's very scary. One of the things we, we spent some time with uh, Tara Lyons, who was an AI advisor to President Obama in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and, and just told a wonderful story to us about how uh, the Obama administration and the OSTP went on a listening tour across the country to, to hear uh, the hopes and dreams and concerns of citizens like you and I on questions like this. And I, I really applaud that the work of the administration and the work of OSTP in those days and Terra Lines in particular to recognize that, that in order to have this public debate about issues like data privacy and 
uh, the bias of AI systems and how far do we think AI should go to disrupt existing processes and, and um, society, um, they went on this listening tour in order to better understand um, the issues that citizens wanted to get on the table. And I think it's a, it's a necessary part of a public policy debate. Mm -hmm. Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, the, the demonstration of bias in these AI systems, and I keep, I keep trying to tell people, you know, AI is as good as the data it's trained on. You know? mm -hmm. It's not often forward, you know, you don't, you're not building leading indicators in many cases into these AI mm -hmm. systems. So let's understand what they're good at and, you know, what they're, what they're not so good at. Um, so we've got a lot yes. of questions in the chat about taxes and the environment. And I know you've been very public about saying that part of what could help us with carbon emissions is some better way or smarter way of taxing uh, the use of carbon. Yes, yeah, and I, um, uh, for those who are interested in uh, 2016, uh, I delivered a TED, uh, TEDx talk on this, on this topic, how can taxes save the planet? And, and uh, we told the story of a uh, carbon tax regime in British Columbia and, and no matter what side of the political aisle you find yourself on uh, around climate change, and it, it can be very politicized, of course, but the story in British Columbia is one that I think we really all should take note. It worked. I mean, they, that, back to the Ronald Reagan quote, you know, if you tax carbon emissions, you, know, you will get less fossil fuel consumption. What was interesting, though, and I think an interesting twist of the, the tax policy in British Columbia is that they actually took the tax receipts that they derived from taxing carbon and they fed it back into the uh, back into the economy. So they actually cut taxes, they actually cut taxes by a greater amount than the amount that they took in. So that's a it was a revenue neutral bill. Now there's obviously winners and losers in that, but if you look at the results, the results were that after imposing a tax on carbon, uh, fossil fuel emissions went down. And if that's your desired result, then just like if I gave, I'll give this example in the TED Talk, if you as a community, if you're concerned with uh, a childhood obesity, then if you tax soda and other sugary beverages and uh, foods, um, you will you will get a, have a, a positive effect, and that's been proven in communities around the world. So this interplay with tax policy, some call them sin taxes. If you want less of something, then you know if you want to curb smoking, raise the taxes on cigarettes. Fewer people will smoke. It works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, that is absolutely fascinating. So one of the things that intrigues me, um, and Rebecca Henderson, you probably know her, oh, oh, she's from Harvard, and she recently wrote a book called Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, which really brings together these issues of environmental concerns, the, the inequalities inherent in capitalism, how we've kind of allowed ourselves to get out of balance. Um, but one of the things I think systemically we're really bad at is looking at externalities, and it often shows up in the tax system, right? Which is, you know, yeah. I think I'm doing X and it has this right. unintended consequence of Y. Um, and one of the tough things is that you have to have a vantage point which allows you to see those relationships. And a lot of times the way we set up our tax systems don't do that, right? Um, and so how, do you, how yeah. do you begin to get that more systemic view mm -hmm. of, you know, if I, for example, just to, I live in New Jersey, right? So, um, you know, local schools are funded by local school taxes. And there's, I yeah. forget how many, but let's say there's 5,000 school districts in New Jersey, each of them making completely independent decisions about mm. what they're going to do for their schools, which has all these knockover effects into, you know, what communities are desirable, what amount of infrastructure do yeah. you need? You know, if you're having developers coming in, what do you expect from them? I mean, it's all this stuff that's just right. a giant hairball at the end of the day. And how yeah. do you get some of that untangled? Mm, yeah, complicated. And uh, as you highlight, there are negative externalities. Sometimes, though, there are, there are also positive externalities. If you, um, you from your tax policies and um, uh, one area of tax law that we spend quite a bit of time in, in is the tax incentives. How can governments, you know, think of carrots and the stick? And often we think of regulation and the stick of government. But what about the carrots? And what about incentive mechanisms, uh, whether it's tax, cut, tax cuts or infrastructure breaks or, or low income financing or many incentives that governments can take. We've had you know, quite a few governments reach out with the question of 
how do we diversify our economies? How do we how do we attract certain businesses? And and so something that you said earlier, reader, I think is is very applicable here. Government is increasingly making data driven decision making. The old days of policy of just sort of sticking your thumb in the wind and seeing which way is it blowing are gone, that there's an intensity of leveraging machine learning and other advanced technologies to, to uh, analyze reams of data in order to make smarter decisions. That data increasingly is informing on what those externalities are. And that's exciting to me. It's an exciting area of, of tax law and technology. And again, in this pandemic emergence where we're headed is opportunities for governments to make better decisions for their citizens. They're, they're trying to do the right things and there are new tools that they just haven't taken advantage of yet that will allow them to better serve the citizens. And isn't that really what it's all about? That's inspiring, really inspiring. Well, I used to work in government. That was my first job after graduate school uh, in between a few little failed entrepreneurial ventures. <laughs> but, um, but what was fascinating to me about it was how big an impact you could really have. Um, and I, I happen to work for the city yeah. of New York and people don't realize, you know, the government of the city of New York is one of the biggest buyers of things, repairer of yeah. bottles, you know, um, mandating yeah. the, um, the, 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 the way buildings are managed. So a great example of um, this new use of data uh, was um, the controller of the city of New York was doing, was connecting databases around lawsuits and city budgets. And what he noticed was this fascinating correlation between law, lawsuit awards being granted to people who'd been injured by trees falling on them, branches falling on them. And he was able to correlate that with a corresponding diminishment of the Parks Department budget for tree maintenance. And what he was oh, actually able to do, isn't yeah. that fascinating? And it um, is fascinating, yeah. Because you know, with, with companies, with governments, with policies, you don't see how a change here affects what yeah. happens over there. But he was able, using these big data sets, to actually mm. bring them together. It was Scott Stringer, I think, that did that. Um, mm. And he was able to go to the city council and say, look, you know, if you don't maintain the trees, it's not mm. like you're saving any money because it's just going to come back in the form of lawsuits and people mm. getting hurt and, you know, very bad outcomes. So I think what we're starting to yeah. on the brink of is being able to see some of those relationships. Mm. It's such a great example. I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that and use that. It's such a great example. I, I had the good fortune. I spent a week in Tel Aviv uh, uh, back in 2019 uh, with the incredible technology and startup community and met with a bunch of AI startups and one, a uh, few in particular that could visualize, just imagine the, the wall and showing um, compl complex relationships of individuals and organizations and they could trace and they were, they were searching for where fraud occurred. And by looking at their relationship, they could determine, you know, once they know somebody has been engaging in fraud, looking at not just like two, but what are the six degrees of separation to other organizations they can visually see from all the different data. And one aspect that we've seen from governments, especially the past few months is that there's been a recognition that they have data stuck in different places. And we had a very inspiring discussion with one government in, uh, in, um, um, across Europe, one government in Europe on this issue of recognizing that they had multiple departments that were reaching out to the same citizen that was strugg obviously struggling financially. That citizen owed, probably had a water bill. They probably had tax obligation, property tax, income tax. And you know maybe the driver's license was gonna be revoked and everybody's swarming. They realized that well, we have all this data and we can have six departments all calling, looking for that same euro from, from the, the citizen, or we can coordinate and communicate differently. And, and, and so they're starting to make some real breakthroughs. And it's all about the point that you raised about data from different places, finding correlations and making better decisions how to serve citizens. And I found that so inspiring. I also inspiring. found the tree limb story inspiring too. Well, yeah, there was another one um, where, and this was um, the Department of Health and Human Services, which runs, um, among many other things, you know, treatment services for uh, kids who become ill. And they noticed this really disturbing pattern, which was a kid would be admitted for, say, asthmatic 
problems and and would be sent home and you know would be back within two months with the same problem and so finally somebody in the hhs said well let me let me understand what's going on and so they did a field trip to where these kids were living and what they found was in the overwhelming majority of these cases the kids were living in buildings where the landlord had not done mold um hmm. what do you call it, abridgment or whatever you call it yeah there was mold and they hadn't done anything about it. And mm. so this mold was causing these kids to have asthmatic problems. And yet the, the people involved were typically poor. They didn't have anybody to advocate for them. You know, they were kind of not, not seen. Um, and so what HHS actually did was they opened a small group of lawyers to go after these landlords to repair, mm. <laughs> to repair the buildings so that the kids didn't just keep bouncing in and out of their system. And, yeah. and they've now got a, it's a pretty big group of lawyers trying to bring that balance back. But again, that's another example mm. of, you know, you've got behavior in one part of the system that shows right. up as a problem in another part. And you need, to, you need mm. to sort of see that in order to address it. And sometimes it's not even what's, what I find so uh, inspiring about this field is that it's no one data stream mm -hmm. that tells the story, but it's the, and I think this is where that, you know, as a society, we're not ready to hand the keys over to the machines, right? We're not ready to just give the machines uh, carte blanche ability to devise policies and in our field impose and collect taxes. But, you know, this notion of having humans in the loop and, you know, what I find is the most impactful and creative opportunities for us humans in this space is the discovery of different data streams that to use the word you, you referenced earlier to find those correlations. And it may not be one, but, but I love somebody had, it's the, the phrase, um, um, the creative uh, combinatorial creativity, the combinatorial creativity of multiple data streams to find the correlation to make better decisions. And, and you know, that's happening along with um, one other related opportunity that you know, governments have been showing is that they wanna to build new ecosystems within the communities. We had a wonderful visit by the, uh, the Minister for Trade and Innovation from Scotland visited us uh, in our lab and so really interested in the Cambridge community or other communities around the world like Montreal or New York as well that have attracted certain industries and you know the story of um, AI and data in Montreal and and how you've got this amazing ecosystem has developed it's probably a top three destination in the world for leading AI and data experts. And part of it, I think, is it's because of the investment that governments made to attract. We got uh, an outreach from government in uh, the Middle East that was simply wants to diversify beyond oil, oil dependence and, and wanted to attract other industries. And we think that's an important mm -hmm. part of the equation, too, is, is uh, uh, diversifying economies in order to to improve the overall economy. Absolutely. So something that um, is a big talking point whenever you bring up taxes, right, is um, a couple of related themes. So there was a New York Times story that came out a couple of months ago about the wealthiest Americans based on data that I guess was leaked from the IRS and that these people who are like, multi-billionaires uh, pay virtually nothing in taxes. Then there's all the related concern about all this money, you know, with, with inequality, right? You've got all this money parked at the top of the economic food chain that's just finding its way into these uh, accounts in the Caymans or wherever. Um, mm. Do you see that sort of shifting with this broader available availability of data? I think governments have an opportunity, and I think that we have seen it. We've seen governments imposing new, new laws and using technology in new ways. Um, additional reporting obligations um, on companies to help thwart that. And, and uh, perhaps that's human nature. I think that um, I had mentioned earlier, we'll never eradicate the entirety of illegal tax fraud. Um, I should say that there is, of course, a full range, you know, tax planning is not against the law. No. Tax planning, tax planning is, is legal, but clearly there are some, you know, illegal fraudulent uh, acts that are occurring. And I think you're right, governments are, are taking steps. They have greater ability to use technology in new ways in order to find the bad guys. And, and they're doing that. And um, for all the honest taxpayers who are uh, watching this live or on replay, that you know, we should all be happy about that because um, 
you know, our, our clients tell us that all the time. You know, we just uh, want to pay our fair share. And then that'll keep tax rates low for all of honest taxpayers. Mm-hmm. And so well, I think that's one of the, that's one of those, you know, um, that, that sense of lack of a level playing field, you know, and, and right. of course the IRS in here in the U S has been, people have described it as being disemboweled, you know, so we don't need new taxes necessarily better enforcement of the things that are already on the books would be <laughs> a good first step. Right. I think that they have um, that under this new administration, they've already pledged to to pump uh, billions into new technologies, and and that can only improve the service and the operation. And um, if it if it helps to enforce compliance of the law, then then I think that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that um, has come up um, a lot is that that people often get things wrong <laughs> about about what taxation is, how it works, you know, who should be responsible for enforcing it. Are there any of the kind of things people just don't understand that you think would be useful to have as part of the conversation? Hmm. You mean in terms of um, of personal tax obligation or corporate tax obligation? Kind of how it all works together as a system is what I'm, yeah. I'm I guess I'm thinking about. Because, you know, the yeah. old, I mean, this is a line from history, right? The only certain things in life are death and taxes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't understand why taxes are, you know, on the one hand, you know, of course, who likes paying taxes? Uh, nobody. But yeah. at the same time, in exchange, you get a lot of great stuff for the tax. Mm. And I think people misunderstand that. They think they can get all the benefits without any of the, you know, without, without any of the contributions. Well, I think that's. I think that can be true, and I think that also happens at all levels. You know, it happens in our local communities um, where there's rich debates about property taxes, funding school systems, and. And so you've got a high burden on the elderly that don't have children in the schools and why should they be paying for it? So, you know, you have local debate and then you know, that extends up nationally to questions of corporate versus individual taxes. And, and you know, of course, we have a complex system here in the U.S. And, and I really applaud actions that are happening all around the world to simplify taxes. And you had mentioned in, in the, the preparation for today in the Nordic countries, and it's such a good example, you pay your taxes on a postcard or you go online and you can sort of check what the government already has on you. They know how much you made and, and where you reside and how much you owe and what deductions may be there. And uh, I think we will see, we will see a simplification of, of tax codes, but um, we also recognize that we have public, um, that we have special interest groups, and and as long as we have special interest groups, that you know we will have some complexity in the tax code. But I think that we will see it simplify. We'll see systems like what you reference in the Nordics. I think we'll see that in other corners of the globe too. And I'm I'm excited. As part of the work that we do is we're trying to do our part to help simplify with some of the solutions we're building to provide greater transparency on, on systems. And you know, we mentioned blockchain a couple of times. One rich benefit from blockchain is the increase in the transparency uh, and the immutability of a blockchain system. We think that um, there's a reason why many, many governments around the world are leveraging this powerful new technology to replace um, antiquated systems uh, within governments. And we're really excited about that. There was some speculation maybe a year or two ago that because blockchain was not controlled by a central bank, for example, that it could have the potential to create smart money. You know, and I was, I found this idea really interesting, but if you take money, you know, a dollar bill or something today, it's not very smart. It doesn't know where it's been. It can't tell you anything about its history. It doesn't know, you know, what it was used for. <laughs> it's just a, a, a currency, right? Um, and yet if you had these smart mechanisms of exchange, whatever they are, yeah. blockchain being one, um, you could actually think about money in a radically different way. And one of the proposals I heard, which I'm not sure <laughs> I buy fully, but that you could actually have money that changes the price of things depending on the supply and demand curves in that like little microsecond of making a purchase right. decision, which is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, and that it so upends a lot of the assumptions we make about you know prices and what's fair and you know what right. the medium of exchange is. I, I think that's just really interesting. 
I think it's one of the greatest disruptors that we could face across um, attacks and, and trade issues. And and for those in the audience that are that are tracking what's happening around the world with central bank digital currencies, a digital fiat currency, the fiat currency being the main currency in the U.S., the U.S. dollar and the euro, uh, but having a digital version of that, we're seeing tremendous growth in in the number of countries that are experimenting with CBDC, central bank digital currency, and starting with China, of course, and the work that China has done to um, uh, impose that. The reason we're so interested, Rita, from a tax perspective is precisely what you're highlighting is what comes with that is greater control from government, but also the ability to see transactions perhaps that they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And you could actually embed tax features directly into the currency itself. And it's, it's such a big idea. It's hard sometimes to get your head around it, but you know, tax determination, think you know, you're, you're buying, you're in Europe and you're, you're buying uh, uh, goods or services subject to value added tax and actually embedding the determination into the currency and the payment mechanisms and for governments, the collection. So like that money is, is imposed and collected and it's in the government's hands right away. And, and then if there's credits, it's back to companies and individuals right away, that the greater transparency and opportunity to combine tax and trade policies with central bank digital currencies, I think is like, that's not a today issue as much, but that that is coming to our theater really quickly. And I think it offers exciting growth opportunities for governments around the world. Absolutely. Well, and, and the possibility that you could, you could eliminate a lot of the, just the waste that doesn't really add value and use that, that, that mechanism to create more value. So you've just recently been named to the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce Trade and Finance um, co Committee, and uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about what you're working on there. Sure, thank you, and uh, I'm so honored um, uh, to be uh, appointed by uh, the Secretary of Commerce to the Trade Finance Advisory uh, Council, TFAC. And, and uh, we just started this was, is, uh, within the last month or so, but the purpose of this council is to help U.S. exporters. And uh, I feel like my, my role on the council has been and will be focused on fintech and how advanced technologies can help. But uh, I'm just honored and really humbled to be able to provide service and and help any way that I can to, to unlock um, greater trade finance opportunities. It's a, for those the audience that understand trade finance at all, very complicated, in some cases, very paper-based system and opportunity to digitize trade flows and to introduce advanced technologies like AI and again, blockchain to um, remove some of those obstacles and barriers for US exporters. Uh, that is what uh, the council is laser focused on, improving the trade climate uh, for U.S. exporters and um, uh, really excited to get to work with this team. Yeah. So on that score, um, you know, one of the theories that that I have been taught is like for goods and manufactured stuff, we kind of have a set of rubrics around what that means in terms of trade. Um, we're a lot less clear on what it means to have trade in services and how you value that, mm. how you classify that. So one of my uh, colleagues, Ram Sharan, is basically of the view that a company like Amazon, that their generally accepted accounting practice way of auditing completely misunderstands how they how they capture and create value because it's so much of it's digital and and not not you know it doesn't it doesn't fit a system designed for a, a manufacturing age kind of situation so I'm wondering is that sort of on your mind at the trade council thinking about the export of things like digital products and services and subscriptions and that kind of thing um uh I'm not so sure. I don't know. I think it, it'll be interesting to see the scope of, 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 of work and, and how, as a council, we can help exporters. And, and you know, what's exciting, I look at innovation, I look at companies like Amazon and others from an innovation perspective and the admiration of, um, of, of, of how companies are changing business models and opportunities that that, that, that provides. And and I think there's a full range of U.S. exporters across many sectors, and mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, services and 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 products that yeah. that need help. 
I think those yeah. exporters need assistance. And Absolutely. I think it's a complicated world and trade finance is complicated. And I think banks are trying to do the right thing, but, but uh, how can we as a council help and, and provide some assistance um, is what we're really focused on. Super interesting. I, I mean, I know for myself in the last two months, I've probably started digital subscriptions for something like eight new software as a service things. <laughs> because, you know, I used to buy a floppy disk and stick it in my computer, and now it's all subscriptions. Um, and it just occurs to me, there's so much economic activity flowing into that kind of business model that is really unprecedented. I don't think we've seen that level before of things just becoming subscriptions. You, know, you can buy anything on a subscription these days. True. So, so um, we've got a few minutes left and I thought sort oh of, gosh. what are you excited about working on now? And, and, and then um, how, do our, uh, how do our audience learn more about what you're working on at EY and maybe get, get smarter about taxes? Um, we are really excited about, um, and I'll go back to one of the, how we started with our prosperity collaborative, the work that we do. Um, we're really interested in problem solving through ecosystems. That's a lot of the work that we do is, is forming teams and our and recognition of where we sit within ecosystems and, and, um, and how we, through collaborations, like some of the ones that I've mentioned, uh, you know, that's how problems will be solved. And I'm, um, I love the fact that at EY that we recognize that, as we you mentioned earlier, our moniker to build a better working world, that uh, we need great collaborations to do that. And I think especially as we sit here in uh, August of 2021 and look at what the next 12 months will be, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of issues to be addressed. And, and from our perspective, how can new technologies solving problems for networks and ecosystems, that's something that we're so passionate about. And I think that will be the path to problem solving for um, the foreseeable future. Super exciting. So where do people go to get smarter? Uh, well, you can always reach out to, um, always reach out to me and, and, and members, you know, back to, um, it, uh, mentioned our prosperity collaborative, but can find me on, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and, um, uh, but we love spending time with others across startups and technologists. And we've got rich ecosystem of academics and, and others that, uh, it takes a village in order to solve important problems. And so you can, uh, you, you, you can find me through, through any of those ways. Um, uh, probably easiest, uh, uh, send me a message through LinkedIn or Twitter and would love to connect. That's absolutely great. Well, Jeff, I, I don't know what to say. This has been really fun, but we are we are doing the Yankees versus Red Sox thing, right? So I'll be joining you on your podcast. Uh, that's coming up. It's a home and away series. That's right. This is the away uh, one for me. Red Sox just <laughs> lost to the Yankees, so not uh, thrilled about uh, not thrilled but about we'll have that, a rematch. Uh, U.S. We'll have a rematch, but you're going to come on Better Innovation, our podcast, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. And you've had great guests on Better Innovation. It's, it's again, a great place to go for inspiration. Um, Steve Blank, um, his entrepreneurial circles, lots of people with really smart things to say about how you- innovate. We love it. We love our podcast. Alex Osterwalder, Steve Blank. Uh, we've had um, uh, representatives from government. We've got a new episode coming out with uh, Marcelo Estavio from the World Bank. Uh, so we've had, just, we've had almost 70 guests. We just finished our fourth season and we're getting ready to kick off season five. So Great. check it out. You can find us on any podcast platform, Better Innovation. Um, check it All out. right. Better Innovation podcast. Thank you, Jeff. To be continued. And thank you all for joining us this summer of 2021.